The Chaos Dwarfs were once like their narrow-minded cousins. Exploring deep into the World's Edge mountain, they eventually came upon Zorn Uskull, the Great Skull Land. The place was accursed, and many of the dwarfs chose not to settle in these lands. However, those that did were not protected from the enmity of the land and eventually were twisted and changed. Thus, the Chaos Dwarfs came to be. Covered in chaos runes and blessed by the magics of Ashut, armies march out to claim lands and slaves for the ever-expanding empire. Terrifying war machines and mighty demons battle alongside the Chaos Dwarfs as they fight for dominion over all they can see. Hello, I'm Rob. Welcome to my Chaos Dwarf Army Overview. The Chaos Dwarf roster is an incredibly exciting roster. It's one of my favorite armies from Warhammer Fantasy Battles, so I'm really excited to look over the different units. The Chaos Army roster has basically everything. Solid, massive infantry blocks that can do amazing damage. Cheap, interesting chaff choices, and really interesting war machines and war machine mechanics, as well as, importantly, a train. And the characters are awesome casters that can be mounted on some very unique and cool monsters. There's literally nothing about the Chaos Dwarf roster that isn't great, but they've got some really great rules to back them up, and I think you would really enjoy collecting these and playing these in the old world. Let's get into it and start looking at the army. Let's look at the special rules for the Chaos Dwarfs. The rules most affecting the Dwarven units in this army is Black Shard Armor, Ensorcelled Weapons, and Resolute. Black Shard Armor gives the model that's wearing it a 5-up ward save against attacks with the Flaming Attack special rule. In addition, wizards that are equipped with Black Shard Armor can also wear armor. While not quite as good as Chaos Armor as it's only a ward save against Flaming Attacks, considering most of our casters will be on the front line and potentially even heavily in combat, the fact that we can wear armor is is awesome. Ensorcelled weapons means that hand weapons that a model is equipped with have magical attacks and are also AP1. If you change up to having dual hand weapons or great weapons or a magic weapon, for instance, you'll lose this bonus. This is a great start to the melee frontline units and even some of your anvil units getting AP is wicked. Also, magical attacks as standard is lovely, just in case you come up against some ethereal. Like their dwarven cousins, the Dawizar are resolute. This gives them a minus one to the result of a roll where they're fleeing or they're trying to pursue. Minus one to flee isn't a big deal because we shouldn't be losing combats anyway. However, minus one to pursue is a bit annoying and the inability to run down some enemy targets will cost us some points at some points in the game. Some of the units in the army will have the blazing body special rule. At the start of every combat phase, enemy model, friend, and foe. This in base contact with a model with this special rule suffers a single strength three hit with no AP and the attack is the flaming attack special rule. This is actually great because it's every model that's in base contact with someone with this special rule. So if you are into a large unit of enemy models you could potentially be getting a lot of attacks from this and it's every combat phase so even in the enemy turn you're going to be doing this attack. The hobgoblins in this army are pretty useful thanks to the backstab special rule. If a unit with this special rule is engaged with an enemy unit's flank or rear arc it may reroll any fail to hit rolls made against the enemy unit. Obviously, this is great because the weapon skill on the goblins is not particularly good, and this is going to make them more effective at producing combat resolution. Some of the units in our army will have the Stampede special rule. This is mainly going to affect our bull centaurs, and the impact hits caused by those models will be AP2. Impact hits causing AP2? Lovely. And some models will have the Hellbound special rule. Hellbound models have a 6 at ward save against any wounds caused by non-magical enemy attacks, and they also gain the Fear and Magical Attacks special rule. If the model already has fear, then it causes terror. And additionally, once per game, a hellbound model may reroll one scatter dice or artillery dice. However, should a hellbound model have to make a roll on the misfire table, it's done at minus one. So a free reroll, great, but at the expense of potentially doing some massive misfire results. Because you get to reroll the scatter or artillery dice once per game, this means most likely it's going to come up early in the game. Later in the game, you'll end up with more units in combat and have less units to be able to shoot. Therefore, when you eventually misfire later in the game, hopefully you don't, it's going to be less impactful unless, of course, you end up blowing up your war machine. Pretending not to like magic, but then still casting magic anyway, is what normal dwarfs do. Chaos Dwarfs completely commit to being magicians and they have access to the Law of Hushut. The first spell is the Curse of Hushut, which is a magic missile with a casting value of 9 and a range of 18 inches. The spell can only target enemy characters. However, it may target enemy characters within range and the casting can draw line of sight to, regardless of the usual rules for targeting characters, and may even target an enemy character that's joined a unit that's engaged in combat. The target enemy character must immediately pass a toughness test, if the test is passed, they suffer D3 strength 2 hits with an AP of dash. However, if the test is failed, it suffers D3 plus 2 strength 5 hits with no armor 
or regeneration saves permitted. Obviously, this is super situational. However, if your enemy does have a key linchpin character that you'd like to snipe out, because you're randomly generating the spells and you can always pivot to this, this gives you some real options. But it's based on a toughness test, they're probably gonna pass it. However, really fun if you can get this to work. The next spell is the Storm of Ash. It's a hex spell with a casting value of 10 and it's cast on the caster. Until the start of the next turn sub phase, all enemy units suffer a minus one to any rolls to hit made whilst within nine inches of the caster's model. Rolls of a natural six are unaffected. Area of effect, minus one to hit, is going to be really, really good. Put this on a caster on a large target so it's got a bigger base and you can affect even more of the board. I think you'll see this chosen often. The last spell is the Flame of a Shut. It's an assailment spell with a casting value of nine and the effect is that it causes D3 plus one strength four hits to an enemy unit the caster is engaged with all at AP1 that have the flaming attack special rule. If you are going combat caster, then the assailment spell is particularly nice because you're gonna be adding even more into your combat res. Let's look at the units that you can field in your Legion of Asgore army. Sorry, I mean Chaos Dwarfs, Chaos Dwarfs. For characters, you can have one Sorcerer Prophet or Infernal Castellan per thousand points. You can take one Bull Center Torok for every unit of Bull Centaur renders that you've taken. You can have multiple units of Demon Smith Sorcerers, Infernal Seneschals, and Hobgoblin Khans, and you can have up to one Black Orc boss. For core, you must have one unit of Infernal Guard, you can have multiple units of Hobgoblin Cutthroats, and you can have up to one unit of Black Orc mobs. In the special section, you can have multiple units of Infernal Iron Sworn, Sneaky Gits, Kadai Fireborn, and Bull Centaur Renders. You can have up to one Iron Demon per thousand points, and you can have up to one War Machine chosen per thousand points from either a Deathstreak rocket launcher or a magma cannon. And you can have up to two Hobgoblin bolt throwers. In the rare section, you can have up to one unit of Hobgoblin wolf riders per Hobgoblin Khan taken. You can have up to one war machine chosen per thousand points from either the Dreadquake mortar or a hell cannon. And if you'd like to have a battle standard bearer in your army, a single infernal seneschal can be your battle standard bearer for 25 points and they can choose a magic standard with no points limit. The first character we're going to look at are the Sorcerers of Hushut. These obviously come in a Lord level in the Sorcerer Prophet and the Captain level in the Demon Smith Sorcerer. Taking a look at the Sorcerer Prophet first, we can see that they're the Mighty Toughness 5 with 3 wounds and the absolutely fantastic Leadership 10. The Demon Smith Sorcerer is one less toughness at Toughness 4 with only 2 wounds, both of them equipped with heavy armor and a hand weapon as standard. The wizards have access to demonology, dark magic, and elementalism. And the Sorcerer Prophet is level three, able to be upgraded to a level four. And the Demon Smith Sorcerer is level one, able to be upgraded to a level two. As casters, they have a unique mechanic called the Sorcerer's Curse. If a model with a special rule miscasts, they immediately must take a toughness test. If the test is failed, they lose a single wound, but they gain plus one to their toughness. If they pass the test, then they must roll on the miscast table as normal. There are worse situations than getting plus one toughness to your profile, I don't think you're going to mind that when it happens. Both of the characters have the Infernal Engineer special rule. And unless the model is fleeing or engaged in combat, once per turn, a friendly war machine that's within command range may reroll one scatter dice or artillery dice. The command range for your general is going to be particularly big, especially if put on a large target. Combo the fact that hellbound war machines are also going to get to reroll an artillery dice, and already we're shaping up to have a particularly effective and consistent gun line. The Sorcerer Prophet obviously can also go on some mounts. We could put them on a Bell Taurus or a Great Taurus or on a Lamassu. The Demon Smith can only be put on a Great Taurus or a Lamassu. Both of the characters may also be armed with three special unique weapons. The Blood of a Shut is a nice upgrade. It's a single use item and you use it instead of attacking in the combat phase. You roll a single dice to hit and if you hit then the enemy unit suffers d6 hits. You can target the unit or a single model in the unit. When rolling to wound you roll equal to the armor value of the model that you're attacking. So if they have a four up armor save then you'll wound on a four plus. No armor saves or regen saves can be taken against this attack. What's cool is with your Demon Smith you can actually have multiple vials. It's quite a scary prospect being in close combat with either of these two characters. You can also equip them with a dark forged weapon. It's a hand weapon and can be used in conjunction with the Ensorcer weapon special rule, meaning you'll have magical attacks and also AP1. The way this works is after deployment before the first turn begins, you roll a dice. Then the dark forged weapon has that attribute for the rest of the battle. And roll of a one is an infernal blade. This weapon gains the flaming attack special rule. And roll of a two is malignant and the bearer of this weapon gains the hatred all enemy special rule. The weapon has life bane and the weapon gains the multiple wounds D3 special rule. And roll of a four, they got the Dwalma Leech and the bear of this weapon gains the magic resistance one special rule. And roll of a five, the weapon becomes hellforged and the weapon has plus one strength. Roll of a six, 
the weapon is spell roll. And if the bearer of this weapon is a wizard, they can add plus one modifier to any casting roll they make. If the bearer isn't a wizard, they can improve the armor penetration characteristic by one. There's definitely some big hits there. Multiple wounds D3, pretty nice. Plus one to cast, especially nice. It's random, but it's very cool, and I think I would take this almost all the time. No, I would take it every time. It's awesome. It's super fun. Lastly, you can equip the character with a Naphtha Bomb, which is just a D3 plus one hit with a Flaming Attack special rule. It's fine, but not that big a deal. A pretty decent character to kick us off. A wizard that's also an engineer. Pretty decent in combat and can be mounted on some pretty aggressive mounts. Access to some great laws of magic with the Law of a Shut having some absolutely brilliant signature spells. I can definitely see multiple demon smith sorcerers being taken because their ability to positively affect war machines and in addition be able to do good spells to benefit your army. I can't wait to create some Lord loadouts for these guys because they're going to be awesome. Our melee frontline characters are the Infernal Guard Commanders. These come in two flavors. You have the Infernal Castellan and the Infernal Seneschal. Looking at the Infernal Castellan stat line, we can see that they're toughness five with three wounds and a massive leadership 10. And also an absolutely awesome weapon skill six, which is going to be both good for offense and defense. A standard comes equipped with heavy armor and can be equipped with a shield, but no ability to upgrade to full plate is a little bit sad. Can also be equipped with the Dark Forge weapon to roll on that tasty table or a big old great weapon. The initiative three is pretty good, so you might not want to take the great weapon, but they start at strength five, so that great weapon is going to push them to strength seven. With four attacks, that's a legit scary profile. The Castellan is also not particularly expensive. However, I think survivability may really be an issue. Both characters can also be equipped with fire glaives and hail shot blunderbusses, meaning they can both go into the units that are equipped with those weapons, which we'll talk about later. They've both got Black Shard armor for that five up ward against flaming attacks and rallying cry. So you'll be able to make another attempt to rally a fleeing unit. Lastly, they're both stubborn, which is also really nice as well. All in all, not bad melee frontline characters. And once we start looking at magic items, definitely gonna be able to make some pretty cool loadouts. If, however, we compare them to both Chaos Lords or even Dwarven Lords, both are able to take slightly more magic points and magical upgrades than these, and definitely can have better armor. And ultimately, neither of them are force multipliers for the army, so I'm not necessarily certain I'm going to take them. Our monstrous cavalry melee character is a bull centaur Torek. This is a frontline combat character with an awesome stat line. Pretty fast as well, starting out at movement seven. Toughness five with four wounds, comes equipped with heavy armor as standard, and also it has the armored hide special rule, therefore it has a four up armor save. Also has black shard armor for a five up ward against flaming attacks, and comes equipped with an ensorcelled weapon. You can upgrade them to have a dark forge weapon or an additional hand weapon, or a great weapon. They do have a high initiative of initiative four. So whether or not you want to give them a great weapon to pump their massive strength five up to strength seven, might be something you want to do. Four attacks base at weapon skill five. To add to their combat resolution, they have D3 plus one impact hits, all of which will be at AP2. Causes fear and has swift strike. Combined with their pretty decent movement, you have a really fast and heavy hitting mobile threat in this army. It does have the loner special rule, so we'll only be able to go in other units with the same rule, but that basically means you're just putting them inside a unit of bull centaurs. Also has the stubborn special rule, which is lovely, as do the bull centaurs, so this unit's going to stick around for quite a while. You can give it up to 75 points of magic items, so you can build yourself a pretty decent character here. Honestly, these are great. Just bury them inside a unit of bull centaurs and have them running around. You could even potentially use them on their own to try and generate some combat resolution from some flank charges. However, just that basic five up armor save, which you need a shield to upgrade to a four up, is not that survivable. Thankfully, the unit's fairly cheap at 145 points, so go have fun. Another, but slightly smaller, frontline melee character is the Hobgoblin Khan. For a goblin, a pretty impressive stat line. Toughness 4 with two wounds, you can upgrade them to have light armor and a shield. Again, fairly impressive in combat for a goblin, with three attacks at strength 4, all at weapon skill 5. If you want to, you can give it an additional hand weapon or a great weapon and have a frontline melee goblin for some reason. Comes equipped as standard with throwing weapons, but you can change this up to a short bow. This might make sense when you can see that you can put them on top of a giant wolf. When you do so, the unit becomes a fast cavalry unit. You gain access to the fire and flee special rule, meaning you can make a standard shoot reaction and then run away. And also obviously makes them much faster with swift stride if you'd like to charge. A standard though comes equipped with the special rule backstab, which as we know, if you make flank or rear charges, is going to let you reroll to hit, which is pretty good with weapon skill five. It's also evasive, so if it is shot at, it's gonna be able to potentially move out of shooting range and has the warband special rule, meaning you can add rank bonuses to leadership to make them honestly have pretty good leadership. Starts out at leadership seven. I think you're more likely to put a hobgoblin card on a giant wolf and use it to move block the enemy, very much like you maybe would do with a gyrocopter or a great eagle. But like, what if you did? 
put like a hobgoblin can on a giant wolf, give him a great weapon, charge him into a dragon that's nearly been killed by war machines, to be fair. However, he was the last guy to kill him. That would be rad. Unlikely, but rad. You can also take a Black Orc boss in this army, but we'll look at that when we cover the Orc and Goblins army roster. Let's start looking at the core units, and the first core unit is the incredibly versatile Infernal Guard. A classic Dwarven sat line with strength and toughness 4. They come as standard, equipped with heavy armor and a hand weapon. You can upgrade them to have a shield as well, so you can have a nice 4-up armor save, AP 1, one attack frontline infantry dwarf unit. You can take a full command, you can have a magic standard up to 50 points, pretty nice for a core unit and one unit per thousand points can have the drilled special rule and you can also upgrade them to have the black shard armor special rule which will give you that five up ward save against flaming attacks they're a close order unit so they're going to be able to get quite a lot of static combat resolution the shield wall special rule which means once per game they're going to be able to give ground instead of fall back in good order and they're also stubborn which is great because they have a massive leadership nine before you even get near character auras so i agree with you not very versatile so far but you can actually give them a range of different weapons and to start out with, this is a regimental unit and a detachment unit. This means effectively you can have one regimental unit of Infernal Guard and a couple of detachments of Infernal Guard as well. And seeing as you can equip them with different weapons, you can really build yourself a solid front line with just Infernal Guard models. As we said, as standard, they come with a hand weapon, which is ensorcelled, giving them AP1 and magical attacks, and heavy armor. Upgrade them to a shield and we've got a front line four up armor save infantry unit however if we want to we can change it up and have great weapons which can be strength six which is pretty good on our already low initiative dwarven unit this feels like a particularly good detachment unit to be counter charging for your regimental unit you can also equip this unit with one of two different ranged weapons fire glaives and hell shot blunderbusses the fire glaive is an 18 inch range strength four ap1 armor bane one missile weapon however it's also brilliant in close combat giving you strength plus one taking out strength five AP1, also with armor bane, but requires two hands. This is an all around excellent weapon for your Infernal Guard, pretty good medium range shooting, and still also awesome when used in close combat. The Hellshot Blunderbuss is quite different. It's incredibly short range with 12 inches, strength three, AP1, but it has the multiple shots D3 special rule and volley fire. To remind ourselves of volley fire, half the models in the ranks after the first rank are going to be able to shoot in addition to the models in the front rank. Hellshot Blunderbuss has also got a special rule where they suffer no modifiers for firing at long range or for using the multiple shots D3 special rule or while making a stand and shoot charge reaction. And in addition, if 20 or more models belonging to the same unit shoot at the same target with Hellshot Blunderbusses, they may re-roll any rolls of a natural one when rolling to wound. So really short range and won't necessarily come into effect very early in the battle. However, you're a Chaos Dwarf, you have loads of war machines, and you're going to be chucking all sorts of different munitions at your opponent, and they're going to one run straight at you, and you're going to be able to unload with these, especially if you can make the detachment reactions where you're going to be able to stand and shoot for your regimental unit. So how do you equip your army? I don't know, it's a great question. Fire glaives feel like they've got some pretty good use. Maybe I would make my regimental unit all have fire glaives, and then my detachment units have blunderbusses. I also like the idea of potentially creating a unit of great weapons as a detachment, and being able to counter charge for my regimental unit. So there are loads of ways to build these and they're great. At core points, we can build ourselves little warbands or massive warbands of hobgoblin cutthroats. Unsurprisingly, they are not particularly survivable. At toughness three, they come equipped with shields and you can upgrade them to have light armor or you can trade out the shield to have a bow. You can give them a full command and they're a horde and a warband. The warband is gonna give them additional leadership up to their rank bonus and also give them reroll charges. And horde is gonna allow them to increase their rank bonus. They're also levies, so they cannot use the Inspiring Presence for you in general or benefit from the Battle Standard Bearer. However, also when they break and flee or are run down, they're not going to cause panic tests for the rest of your army. However, they have that cheeky backstab rule. So I guess there are two ways that you can build this unit. They're sensationally cheap at three points each and equipped with short bows because they have volley fire, they can do an absolutely amazing amount of shooting. However, it's only 18 inches and they're only ballistic skill three. So that shooting is going to be particularly weak. You could give them light armor and build a massive brick of them and just use these to do a wound tank, effectively pumping up their leadership thanks to both Warband and Horde. So they've got a pretty good resistant leadership and use them as an anvil so your enemy's expensive units are just killing trash goblins. No offense to goblin players. But if you want, you could just build a cheeky small little unit of 10 and use them to flank charge and get yourself that cheeky backstab bonus. 
I said cheeky twice, I know, but there we are. You can also take up to one unit of Black Orc mob, but again, we're going to cover that in our Orc and Goblin review. Moving into the special section, we are going to stick with Goblins because we can take units of Sneaky Gits. The big bonus to this unit is that their weapon skill, ballistic skill, and initiative four. At Toughness 3, they come equipped as standard with two-hand weapons and throwing weapons. If you want to, you can upgrade the entire unit to light armor and have both a champion that's a murder boss and a musician. I think the key takeaway from this unit is that they have the ambushes special rule. No bonuses to those ambushes, so from turn two, you're gonna be rolling a dice, and on a four plus, that unit is gonna come in or not. And that's the big risk with ambushing unit. But thanks to that backstab special rule, this is gonna be a problem for your opponent. Very much like with regular dwarfs, as your opponent is rushing towards your gun line, they really don't want the ambushers to be charging in the rear or the flank to be adding to combat resolution or to be slowing the enemy down. They're levy, so they won't cause panic for the rest of the army. They're in the skirmish formation and they have moved through cover. So they're particularly fast and nimble around the board. These are gonna be really good for hunting war machines if they actually arrive from ambush. A standard this unit comes in a unit size of 10. So 60 points for a unit that's gonna ambush on and cause your opponent a headache might really be worth it. The next unit we're gonna look at are the Infernal Iron Sworn. This unit is like the upgrade you get going from Chaos Warriors to Chosen Chaos Warriors. Still toughness four, instead of the heavy armor that you'll get, the Infernal Guard, the Infernal Iron Sworn have full plate armor. You can also equip them with shields as well, so a nice three up armor save. They also standard have Black Shard armor, so that five up ward save, against flaming attacks and in comparison to the infernal guard they have an additional attack and plus one to their weapon skill this unit is also a regimental unit meaning you could turn your infernal guard into detachment if you wanted they also have the shield wall special rule so the first time that they have to fall back in good order they can give ground instead they're stubborn so they can stick around in combat for ages they're veterans so they don't need to be anywhere near your generals if you don't need them to be and they're drilled which is a great additional rule meaning you can make a movement after a redress they also have the special rule quell panic and unless this unit is fleeing any friendly unit that's within six of this unit that has the levy special rule can re-roll fail panic tests however building this unit as a defensive block with full plate armor and a shield feels like a bit of a waste when they have got two attacks apiece. Many elite infantry units in the old world don't have that volume of attacks, and so it might be quite nice to give them one of the weapon upgrades. You can either equip them with a great weapon or a halberd. Two strength six attacks per model feels pretty decent. Although, of course, you might just end up losing all of them before you get to swing. Because you're playing dwarfs, it's very unlikely you're ever going to be getting the charges off unless there was some sort of goblin shaped unit you could be using as a sacrificial lamb in the turn previously to stop the faster units your opponent's going to be using to charge at you. The next special unit is incredibly unique and it's the Kadai Fireborn. This is a melee demon unit with some pretty quirky little rules. They come in units of three and they have two wounds apiece at toughness four. No armor to speak of, but they do have a five up regeneration, which is pretty interesting on a big flaming demon. They're unbreakable and unstable. Therefore, every point by which they lose combat, they're going to lose a wound instead of running away. They're immune to psychology, which makes sense as they're a ball of fire, and they cause fear, which makes sense because they're a ball of fire. They have the flaming attack special rule, which is makes sense because they're a ball of fire. And they have the ensorcel weapon special rule, meaning they're doing magical attacks and they have a AP1 on their three attacks each at the pretty impressive strength five and weapon skill four. Lastly, don't forget that they have the blazing body special rule, meaning they're going to be doing quite a lot of additional hits in each combat. I don't see this as a frontline melee unit. And instead, this is a unit you're going to use to try to charge into flanks to help add to combat resolution. And seeing as the dwarfs are pretty slow, the movement six on this is pretty good. So maybe we'll use them to keep up with some faster characters that have been mounted or some bull centaurs. Let me know if you think these are hot or not. The next unit in special is a pretty unique unit as well in the bull centaur renders. This is a monstrous cavalry melee unit and kind of acts like a cavalry unit, but kind of feels like a chariot unit. They start out in units of three and each model has got three wounds at toughness five. A standard they come equipped with light armor and they have the special rule armored hide one, giving them a five up armor save. And if you want, you can upgrade them to have a shield. At movement seven, they're quite quick. They have swift stride, so they're gonna be able to have more consistent and longer charges. And they have first charge, so the first time they charge, they're gonna disrupt the enemy rank bonus. And when they do charge, they have D3 impact hits each, which at strength four, and thanks to the stampede special rule, it's gonna be AP two. And this is why they feel slightly more like a chariot unit than they do a combat unit because the bull centaur renders i only have two attacks each they're only strength four and they're at weapon skill four so don't feel they're going to generate a lot of constant ongoing combat resolution when they're not doing charges if however you want to upgrade them to have great weapons kind of makes sense because the strike last effect that you get from great weapons putting them to initiative one is counteracted by being able to charge quite well meaning you'll be striking at initiative four 
at strength six, which is quite nice. If they do end up getting bogged down in combat, they are stubborn. And because they have the loader special rule, that means you're going to be able to add the hero, the ball centaur Torok, into the unit. And maybe that's the way to help produce even more combat resolution. You have the ability to add a full command onto the unit and the champion in the unit gains an extra attack. So if you were to add in the ball centaur Torok into the unit, combined with a champion and maybe a decent magic standard, you could potentially build little bricks of very solid charging units from Bull Centaurs being the delivery system for Centaur Torox. One of the reasons to play Chaos Dwarfs is its awesome war machines, and none are more awesome than the Iron Demon. This is, for all intents and purposes, a train. Although its troop type is Heavy Chariot. It's tough to seven with seven wounds, and it has a three-up armor save. So it's definitely very survivable, but it is also a large target. So small arms fire and also cannons and war machines are going to try and pick this off. Before we look at any of those special rules, let's look at the Carriage Hall of Special Rule which is awesome, but maybe a bit of a gimmick. This rule allows two friendly War Machine units with the Steam Carriage special rule within the model's rear arc and within eight inches of its base at the beginning of the movement phase to move when the Iron Demon moves. The War Machines must still end up within the rear arc of the Iron Demon and they must still be within eight inches of it. However, they're considered to have not moved. The practical implications of this is that you might be able to move your war machines out of the charge ranges of some of your opponent's units. You may also be able to move your war machines to look around a piece of terrain to gain some line of sight on an enemy unit. The other implication is you might be able to make choo-choo noises when you move your war machines, which is probably the reason you should play. There are some stipulations though, if you use the lumbering destruction move or if you make a charge move, you won't be able to move any of the war machines with your train mechanic. The lumbering destruction rule, which I just mentioned, isn't particularly interesting other than you can't march and instead you add a d6 to your movement and if you roll a one, you can't move for that turn. Because the Iron Demon is effectively a tank, it's unbreakable and immune to psychology, meaning you definitely use it to pin some of your enemy units and use it as an anvil. If, however, you are able to use it as a charging unit, it does d6 plus one impact hits, which are at the mighty strength eight, which is genuinely really impressive. In melee, it doesn't have any particular combat to speak of. However, it does have D3 plus one stomp attacks, which, thanks to the grinding wheel special rule, are all going to be at AP2. However, you can't make grinding wheel attacks against a unit that's got the unit type behemoth. However, if you want to, you can add a good combat profile onto this unit. A stock, the unit comes equipped with a steam cannonade. The steam cannonade is effectively a two barrel volley gun. It's 18 inch range, strength five, AP1 and has got Armor Bane 1. In order to shoot it, you roll two artillery dice before making any rolls to hit. The number of shots is equal to the total of both artillery dice. If one of the dice is a misfire, then you shoot all of the shots at minus one to hit. If both dice are a misfire, then no shots are fired and the model loses a single wound. You shoot the number of shots based on the ballistic skill of the crew, which is ballistic skill four, which is pretty decent. Yet you can upgrade the Iron Demon to be Hellbound, meaning you can reroll one of the artillery dice. And also if you're near one of the Infernal Engineers, you're also gonna be able Able to reroll another artillery dice so you've got some pretty consistent shooting coming out of the iron demon if you want it to however if you did want to make this unit more effective in combat then you can give it the skull cracker upgrade this changes the impact hits from d6 plus one to 2d6 plus two and they gain the armor bane one special don't forget all of those are going to be at strength a ap2 which is pretty good. So a large chariot that you can use to pin in your opponent at high toughness with big wounds and a good armor save feels like a really interesting piece I think dragging the war machines might be a bit of a gimmick, but it depends what terrain is like, and in the right situation, it might be amazing. It's definitely a heavy chariot and could potentially do some incredible combat resolution with all of the impact hits and stomps on turns in which it charge. And as a gun platform, it's got some pretty decent shooting that's gonna really start to worry your opponent as they're trying to move towards your lines. Overall, I love this model. I love this unit, it's great. The first of the War Machines that we'll look at from the special section is the Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher. For rules purposes, this works like a stone thrower with two different profiles. You can either fire demolition rockets or infernal incendiaries, both of which are between 12 inches and 48 inches in range. The demolition rockets, however, uses the small three inch blast template and the model that's underneath the hole suffers a strength six hit at AP3 and multiple wounds D6. So it's an armor bane as well, so a six to wound is gonna make that AP4. If you decide to shoot the Infernal Incendiaries rocket, then use the five inch blast template, which is strength three, 
no AP, and has got the flaming attack special rule. I think it's fair to say, or at least maybe you've picked up on, I'm not that bothered by stone throwers because you always have to roll to hit in addition to the Templar actually hitting as well. However, I do really like the idea of attempting to get the D6 wound shot off and hitting some of the larger targets my opponent may have. You can also upgrade this to have the Hellbound special rule, meaning you get to reroll one of the artillery or scatter dice, making this way more effective. And if you're near any of the sorcerers, which are also engineers, you're going to be able to re-roll those dice as well. Lastly, you can also upgrade it to have the Steam Carry special rule, so you can use your Iron Demon to move it into a position that's more favorable. Honestly, the rocket launch is not bad. People are going to be really worried about that D6 wound shot, and they're going to run towards you much quicker. It's fairly cheap. The other artillery piece is a magma cannon, and this is a fire thrower. Fire throwers are just slightly more complicated stone throwers, where they use the flame template, and anything the flame template hits is going to cause a strength 5 hit, at AP1 with unsurprisingly the flaming attack special rule. These fire throwers normally have pretty limited range. However, you can upgrade the magma cannon to have the steam carriage special rule, meaning you can pull this magma cannon slightly closer than your opponent would be expecting and possibly dropping a massive teardrop shaped template on your opponent's troops. You can also make this a far more consistent war machine by taking the hellbound special rule. Our last war machine in the special section is the hobgoblin bolt thrower. The bolt thrower is obviously crewed by goblins and so it's got pretty low ballistic skill, but it's also very cheap. So some opportunity cost to just keep spamming some little shots at some pretty valuable targets in the enemy, causing multiple wounds too at strength six, might be not a bad idea. Moving on to the rare units, we are going to stick with our war machines. You can either choose the Dreadquake Mortar or the Hell Cannon, and I've covered the Hell Cannon extensively in the Slaves to Darkness review, so let's look at the Dreadquake Mortar, which is honestly just cooler anyway. The Dreadquake Mortar is an absolutely fantastic, massive stone thrower. It's pretty survivable, toughness 7, with 4 wounds, equipped with heavy armor. However, if you upgrade it to have an Ogre Loader, you're going to add plus 2 to its wounds characteristic. That's toughness 7 and 6 wounds pretty tough to get rid of. Its weapon profile is, unsurprisingly, awesome. It's got a range of between 12 and 48 inches, and it uses the large 5-inch blast template. If underneath the hole, it's strength 6, AP 3, that does multiple wounds D6. If not under the hole, then it is strength 3, no AP. And it also has a special rule Quake, which has got Bretonian players quaking in their boots. This special rule is until the start of your next turn subphase, any unit, friend or foe, that's within 2d6 inches of the central hole of the Blast Templar, after it scatters, suffers a minus one modifier to its movement characteristic, and cannot use Swift Stride special rule. If you're building more of a Chaos Dwarf gun line, you probably don't want the enemy to be running towards you as fast as it can. And if you're able to go first and drop a couple of Dreadquake bombs, so that your opponent isn't going to be able to move as fast and isn't going to be able to use Swift Stride, that might buy you an entire turn of extra shooting. However, there's a big detriment to this war machine in that it's got this slow to reload special rule. If this weapon shot in the previous turn, you roll a dice and on a one to two, it cannot shoot for this turn because it's too slow to reload. However, you can pay for an upgrade and you can upgrade to having an ogre loader. And if you do so, you add plus one to this roll, meaning that it's only gonna happen one out of every six times. It is a massive downside if you aren't able to use your nearly 200 point war machine just because it didn't reload. However, I think the effectiveness of it is gonna outweigh the fact that it's got that limitation. The Ogre Loader also adds plus two wounds and also gives it a couple of extra attacks in combat. Lastly, you can give it the Hellbound special rule, so you're gonna be able to reroll one of those artillery dice. And if you want to, you can give it the Steam Carriage special rule, so you can move it along and keep it out of combat. This isn't that much more expensive than the Death Streaker Rocket. However, its impact is much more effective against your opponent. So none of these things are guaranteed, but it is cool and you have the potential to do D6 damage to some units, which is going to be potentially game-changing. Feels a little bit underwhelming to end the Chaos Dwarf review on Hobgoblin Wolf Riders, but this is where we are in the rare section. This light cavalry unit is incredibly fast. Movement 9, and they're also a skirmishing unit, meaning they've got a lot of movement options on the table. They're also evasive, meaning they're going to be able to move out of the way potentially if the opponent targets them in shooting. They can make the fire and fleet charge reaction, which they'd be making with short bows at Ballistic Seal 3, but, you know, it's still an option. But I think it's the upgrades that you can give to this unit that's going to make it more effective. You can give them the Feign Flight or the Reserve Move special rule. Feign Flight as a charge reaction is going to be particularly good as this combo so nicely with the skirmishers formation and the high movement that the unit has. This means the unit is going to be able to flee from charges, rally back and then keep making that process happen in conjunction with some of the other special rules and units we've got in this army, causing the enemy units to fail charges and leave them in positions that they don't want, especially to get counter charge by some of your larger blocks is really nice. All the while you can keep shooting with your short bows and then eventually in the right situation 
you can potentially use this unit to charge into the flanks or the rear and use their backstab special rule. And if all else fails, a small unit of Hobgoblin Wolf Riders are going to be able to get around the flanks of the enemy units and potentially be charging into their war machines shutting them down. Obviously, they're not that survivable. Toughness 3, Light Armor and Shield, you can't expect them to survive particularly long and they are not a frontline combat unit. And that wraps up our Chaos Dwarf roster review and what a roster it is. Lots of versatility from the core units, lots of support and potentially amazing character builds from the sorcerers at the top on some massive monsters. Lots of unique and interesting utility units Hobgoblin Wolf Riders and also Sneaky Gits potentially coming in fairly clutch in an army that could be maybe very static. However, that static army style isn't much of an issue when you've got things like Iron Demons and Dreadquake Mortars causing your enemy to have to move towards you. And when they do move towards you, you've got some withering small arms fire and interesting counter charge choices like the Bull Centaurs and the Kadai. I think I should also mention, obviously, the Kadai Destroyer, a famous unit from the Chaos Dwarf roster, is missing. And I would say it does feel like we are missing a monster from the roster. At least being allowed to potentially use the giant from Warriors of Chaos would have felt pretty cool. I do really enjoy the addition of the goblins in the army, and it really helps identify it as different to something like Warriors of Chaos or just dwarfs. I've absolutely loved looking through this roster, but of course, I always want to know what you think, so please do let me know in the comments below. And if you've loved the video, please let me know what bits you'd like me to cover in the future, what bits you did and didn't enjoy, so hopefully I can make better videos in the future. Thanks to everyone on the Squarebase Patreon for helping me create this content. We've got an awesome little Discord community going there now, and it's just really nice to pop in there and talk about all the things I love about the old world. Thanks very much for watching the video, and I hope you have a lovely day.